They're named after former club members who were very significant in the uh, 33 year history of our club. Uh, the first one I'm going to present this evening uh, is uh, entitled the John Zacharias Award. John was one of our presidents here at SAC uh, and very uh, technically oriented. He was a programmer for the state of California and um, just a staff programmer who did whatever they assigned to him. He was very good at that. You know, he really liked the Amiga because the environment, the programming environment is so open uh, and uh, he really enjoyed that, did a lot of nice uh, nice programming for him. One of the packages that for the Amiga that he marketed commercially was called AE Mail. And uh, I don't know whether any of you have seen that. I have a copy of it. Um, so that's a little bit about who John was. And uh, so we have the John Zacharias Award for Outstanding Technical Assistance to the Sacramento Amiga Computer Club for 2019. And it's presented this year to another one of our more recent SAC members. He is a, an Amiga fan from way back, building his own collection of classic hardware and software. He has worked as a professional animator using Amiga hardware and software, making his living for about 15 years in that field. He has given up his time and resources to help with our SAC storage area, formerly known as the Abyss. <laughs> he is successfully helping to preserve our hardware collections through his expertise and knowledge of modification and preservation of our Amiga Classic hardware. He's very enthusiastic about the future of SAC, our club, actively participating in our local meetings, freely sharing his knowledge, structuring demos, and bringing items of interest to the meetings. He's involved in information technology for Northrop Grumman Aircraft, keeping very large hardware systems operational through outsourcing parts across the world for legacy equipment worth hundreds of millions of dollars. He is our SAC solder tech having fun with his extensive soldering setup that makes preserving and upgrading even the least promising hardware, and we have a lot of that. Uh, impressive in the results department. The John Zacharias Award for 2019 for outstanding technical assistance to the Sacramento Amiga Computer Club in innovation in Amiga preservation, annual concepts, and SAC participation is presented to Chris Nelson also known as Chris Toast online. Now Chris was unable to be with us this evening. Uh, his father's health has taken a tremendous turn for the worse uh, and uh, he is in Texas until uh, that uh, situation resolves. But we wanted to give this to him and uh, when he returns we will present it with appropriate ceremony at one of our club meetings. And I'd like to give Chris a hand even though he's not here. And then we have the Dan Klosko Award for 2019, and we want to welcome Cynthia Klosko, who is here this evening with us. Uh, thank you for coming, Cynthia. Um, Dan Klosko was uh, another similarly oriented technical guy, uh, and he also was uh, really an organization guy as well. Uh, he was the one who founded the Abyss uh, and provided the, all that free storage area, about a thousand square feet of it, to us for probably 15 or 20 years. So, uh, and it's been kind of a shock to have to do without it. Uh, but uh, it's been reduced exponentially. Fortunately, we've gone from a thousand square feet down to about 800. No, that's not right. To about 80. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just, no, never mind. 800 is what I want, but uh, 80 is what we have. Um, and Dan was a, a really great guy. Those of you who knew him um, knew that he was really, you know, Amiga all the way through. He really helped uh, structure the Amiga 30th event that, Dan, that uh, uh, Bill spearheaded and uh, did a whole lot of work for that. And all of us who knew him uh, really counted him a good friend. So we've named this award after him uh, for outstanding service to the Sacramento Amiga Computer Club for 2019, presented to a man who has dedicated his efforts to the success of Andy West, 
as an Amiga community gathering over a period of many, many years. He's an Amiga fan from way back, also building a great collection of classic and NG hardware and software. Given of his time and expertise to help with Amy West in many ways, he's part of the Friends of Amy West, an ad hoc group that provides funding for expenses for which our show has no budget. Uh, really, our show doesn't have any budget, uh, so that's most of it. Um, he's enthusiastic about the future of Amiga, actively participating in software development and beta testing for a variety of developers while making coding contributions to these products. He is also involved as an instructor and go-to resource man for the annual Amiga OS DevCon at Amy West. And he has supported Amy West by employing his professional skill to help make our show floor more functional. His professional knowledge helps keep us out of trouble with our show floor layout every year. And the Dan Colosco Award for 2019 for Outstanding Service to the Sacramento Amiga Computer Club and to Amy West is presented to Paul Sattler. Thank you very much. <laughs> you are welcome. Couldn't go to the next one. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> We also give awards to our uh, sponsors, uh, and this year uh, we had several. We have several sponsors. We have uh, six sponsors this year, um, and uh, two of them were able to attend. So, for various reasons beyond everyone's control, apparently, um, uh, Amiga Kit was then able to attend because of uh, regulation changes due to Brexit, uh, and all those regulation changes hit October 31. Maybe. 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 <clears throat> we'll see. It's really that. Well, yeah, but he's got to be prepared. So that's why he's here. Uh, Aaron Smith is a victim of his own success uh, by uh, selling too many replacement keyboards for Amiga 500s. And his partner are badly assembling them as we speak. So that's why they didn't come. Um, we are usually a, uh, the, the club, obviously, is a sponsor. So the ones who didn't get here. Our Amy West 2019 Gold Sponsor, uh, Trevor Dickinson of AE Unlimited, and we want to make sure that we make the distinction between AE Unlimited and Trevor Dickinson. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that that error did reveal, however, was that there's a lot of people reading that blog. So that's kind of good news, uh, and that's what I hope to, uh, to promote in the correction to that uh, blog post. But Trevor, we thank you very much for your continued support of the show and your funding has helped provide several different things. So uh, thank you very much for, for being on board this year. Thank you. And the other one is uh, presented to our attending sponsor um, from uh, Amok. Mr. Stephen Soley and Mr. Len Hank Bunn, along with him, where are you, Len? There he is, about to get back in the back of the room. So, Stephen, come on and up and accept for a, a, a leading users of Calgary. And we have two other Unlock members here this time. Who are you? Raise your hands. That's right, okay. Joe's got it. It's the Canadians. That's right, the Canadian vision. Uh, friendly though, very friendly invasion. We like that friendly. Hey, and then we'll, hey, hey, hey. we'll invade and then we'll apologize. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Now I guess it was, was this last night that we did this? Yes. It was, okay, all right. So, early hours of the morning. Early hours of the morning, okay, that's right. Uh, so we're going to see here. There it is. Very nice. Modern technology is wonderful when it works, and this one worked. So Alex, you had presented a fundraiser for uh, GCC and um, M68K, without going into all the technical detail about that. It was a, a piece of software that was about to disappear from, uh, software support disappear from the, dis the distribution. 
uh, from the GCC tool chain. And uh, John Paul Adrian Glaubitz uh, told us about this uh, through, uh, through Alex. And Trevor. And Trevor, yes, exactly. So Trevor wanted me to announce, and I think it's great to announce, that uh, now M68K uh, GCC compiler will continue to be offered. Uh, all of the funds have been raised and paid as of now. Wow. Uh, and we, yeah. Thank you to all of you who contributed, and Adrian says, wow, I'm speechless. Thanks so much, and thanks to everyone to the, in the community. You rock. Yeah. So this evening, our, ban, our, our panel discussion, um, Oh, I will the box. I will explode. Oh my God. Hey, in the box. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the box. In the box, that's right. Uh, oh, I forgot. Sorry, Jerry. Uh, we have one more award to present, and our vice president, uh, Jerry Gray, is going to present it. We've been having a gaming competition. Use the handle. Yes. Let's stay in the box. Stay yeah. in the box. In the box. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? No. Nope. Okay. No. Just switch. switch. Thank you. Ah. So probably everyone's seen that I've been in the back corner with my son doing a little games competition um, for MOS this year. Uh, yesterday, um, before the general, um, you know, a lot of people showed up who were doing uh, River Raid Reloaded, and um, a fellow by the name of James won that. And as it turns out, today he swept in at the end of the competition and took the Trap Runner competition. So James, can you come on up? <laughs> Tomorrow will be Mod Surfer, and if you want to keep him from taking all the trophies home, I really encourage you to come back and um, get to the back corner there and give your hand at Mod Surfer. Um, the trophies, I would like to say, are a result of my children. The, this is a completely custom model from my 15-year-old son using um, Autodesk Fusion, and then my older son printed and painted it. So wow, it's a really cool. one-of-a-kind unique. It says, um, Amy Wiss 2019 champion with the Trap Runner standing on top. So James, Ooh. congratulations. So what was his champion. goal? This was Trap Runner. What was the score? Oh, the score, score was what's the oh, score? Oh, oh, oh I got it. It was five thousand. Oh, in the box. <laughs> I'm in the box. If I can read without my glasses, make it bigger. There we go. Five thousand three hundred and eighty. Second place goes to Cody at 4,295, and third place was Bill mm -hmm. at 3,775. Wow. Well, this evening we're having a panel discussion. Uh, about the International Amigan. Who is the International Amigan? And what do they use their Amigas for? Uh, and so we happen to have a large international contingent here this evening uh, from Denmark, Australia, Canada, Germany, and the United States. Mr. Stevens, please come on forward. Um, and uh, so uh, the uh, Able talents of uh, Bill Borsari as the moderator are going to be employed as well. I get to sit down and listen, which is really a nice thing. And so uh, I'll leave you to this. And thank you very much for joining us. You are welcome. Appreciate it. <coughs> I don't know the mics figured out already. Get there. Okay. Oh. Well, first we have to uh, mic up our oh. participants here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some people have handheld microphones, some people have held with us. We do our best with the resources we're given. How many points for uh... how many points for what? 
because they can't answer them. So we uh, decided that, you know, 
So what other uh, interesting concepts could we have? And um, the idea was to say, wait a minute, we have this, this uh, depth of people that come to the show that share our interest in this platform. Uh, and some of them come from far, far away. Uh, Daniel was here last year and, and was presenting to us. Um, and this year, he brought his lovely family with him because he had to come back. We really appreciate that. Exactly. Niels, this is your first visit to us, yes. which we definitely appreciate. Um, and we were talking a little bit yesterday about Denmark and, and what that means, and we'll learn tonight uh, your experience. Tony comes to us from Australia. I think last time was three years ago. Yeah. So it's great to have you here. Thank as you. we know, that's a long flight too. Um, uh, Steve comes to us from Canada, which we'll talk about. And LD ah. comes from New York. So the, the other thing is that we have a, uh, a group of people that have been doing the Amiga thing for a really long time. Well, I, I don't mean to say they're all old, but we're all getting old. Um, but the point, too, is that um, it, but, but there's also diversity in that. I got my first Amiga in 89. I think you were 89. I think yeah. Tony was probably 82. 87. No one's on the box. Sorry, got the box. Can I see the number on that? Two, two. Oh, it's two. That's why. See, when you get old, your hearing goes. Uh, what? You your eyes your hearing goes. Okay. Oh. Eat that one. Right. Okay. Wait. Other things go. Try to say something. Say something. Hello. That's not too long. That did a bit too long. Okay. Hello. Hello. Office answer. Office answer. So. Uh, Daniel, I think you were also 80s? When did when, when you first? 90s. 92. 92. Pretty late. And then, what's, what's really interesting is LD, what, what was your first year of Amiga LD? 2009, actually. 2009. 2009. So, Whoa. Not only do we have people who have been doing this for a really long time, we have people who have recently come to the community. So I wanted to make this, and, and, and LD is a developer at IBM, programmer, not on the Amigas per se, but everybody else on the panel, myself excluded, uh, are active OS4 developers, for the most part. Modest. I'm not, I'm not developing, I'm beta testing. Okay. I have uh, developed on other systems. Uh, sure, but you're all programmers. Personally. Yeah. A lot of programmers. I don't want to talk about like favorite apps and those sorts of things, but I want to focus on more, and I think the much more interesting is your personal experience where you are and where you were, um, and and sort of how it got to this particular moment, uh, and what you might share. So, um, I don't know if we've done an introduction proper. So, so Niels, maybe you would start with just a, a couple minutes with the introduction of yourself. Okay, I um, as you already mentioned, I got my first Amiga in '89, and. Um, uh, Within few, a few weeks, actually found that uh, this was uh, a great system to work on, and uh, not just to play games on, which of course is the first thing you do when you get one. Um, so, and uh, well, uh, uh, during the years uh, uh, from around the mid nineties or so. I've been uh, translating and beta testing uh, from OS 3.5, OS 3.9, and further on. And uh, that's what I'm still doing. I recently retired and, and uh, hope to uh, start developing for the Epic as well uh, within not too much time. Thanks. I, I was an engineer, I'm still an engineer. I was an engineer at a television station in Australia and in 1984 I was sent over to London to install an EMG studio or something and whilst I was there I wandered into what they call the high street shops there was the Commodore 64 and, and there was a monitor there that was playing some game I forget what it was I had to have one so I bought one of these and took it back home and Within, I think, two weeks, we had about six people who had ordered, six people in the engineering department who had ordered these machines, and we became Commodore 64. 
mad and we we um, built modems and, and uh, we sent messages to each other over dial up at 75 board. <laughs> <laughs> My offsider there in this um, engineering department retired uh, in 1987 and he went and bought a computer shop <coughs> not, not far from me selling Commodore 64s and 128s as well. One night, about 7 o'clock in the evening, he rang me up and said, Mr. Wyatt, get yourself over here to my house now. I've got a toy for you. <laughs> and he had a Amiga 1000 sitting there on the table. It was NTSC, it was one of the first in Australia, and I was hooked within five minutes of playing with this machine. And I, I haven't stopped since. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> okay. Steve? Hello. Um, is that on? I don't know. Is the switch? Yeah, I know. It's on. The switch is on. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, started in about 88, I think. Amigas? Yeah, around there. Um, and I'm an engineer as well. <laughs> Still am. Uh, I, I, I've done a lot of telecom, uh, board manufacturing, testing, for uh, <coughs> uh, firmware, software, all that good stuff. Uh, and uh, I used my Amigas all throughout in various ways, uh, from the 1000 up to the 3000, never, never could get a 4 and everything. Um, can't hear me. Yeah. So, uh, what else? This one works. Oh, does that work? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, see, it's got flashy lights. Flashy lights. Uh, is this one better? No, I use nails. No? Oh. Nails doesn't work? Okay. No, that nails This one works. It's got a cable. Hello. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway. We cables as from the telecom industry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Telecom. Cables always work. I, I worked in wireless a lot. I know it doesn't work very well. <laughs> uh, I know, but I know how they work. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, uh, right, I got sucked into NG Amiga, next generation, and I've uh, been doing various roles in there ever since. Yeah. Damn. Well, you were here last year. You can go very briefly. Yeah. <laughs> I think no we had problem. a wonderful presentation last year. No, um, I actually um, well, started my media career pretty late. But almost uh, everybody already had an AGA, the 100 or 4000 machine. I started with the A500. Money was short at home, so my parents couldn't afford one. And I neither, so bad luck. So um, I guess it was 92 when I got my first A500, before that was C64 <coughs> and stuff like that. I learned programming on that one. And well, um, I was simply attracted by the graphical capabilities of the machine. And uh, well, everybody, again, everybody I knew who was into computers uh, fell in love with this immediately. Unfortunately, I lived in South America at that time and there was nobody else besides one friend uh, who had another Amiga. So um, anyway, um, with studies in 1996, uh, my Amiga career ended for the next, well, 14 years or so. And in 2010, I, by by accident, I learned about the Miller Timing Project back then, which is now the Polar Star and so on. Um, and returned for December 46, uh, 460, and since then I'm developing for OS 4, Morphos, and also 68K since some months again. So I returned to my old lab. <laughs> I hate to admit it, but actually, I didn't use an Amiga back in the day at all. 
Um, I actually, but I did have a Commodore 64. I think that was the family's first computer, which was bought when I was like that. Um, so that my, my father wanted me to learn basic on it. And then when, we, when I finally had enough funding back in 92 to buy my own machine, I bought a Macintosh. <laughs> I, I, I admit that I loved the Macintosh for many years until they became really boring with OS 10, and I checked it all for Linux. Not working? No? Well, you have to like eat it. Right. How about now? Any better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I was a Mac guy for a really long time, and uh, the only Amiga experience I ever had was in the mid '90s, the local PBS station in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Any Tennesseans? No. Okay, great. So they ran, they ran, they ran all of their graphics on an Amiga, and I was like, "Wow, this thing is uh, this thing's pretty cool." Because of course it was completely apart, and there were wires hanging out of it, and it just it looked fantastic, you know. Like if you got too close to it, it was going to shock you. <laughs> Um, but that was the first Amiga I'd ever seen, and I remembered it briefly because in 2008 or so, I read an article on OS News about Amiga OS and the, uh, at the time, the lawsuit. So nothing's really changed. And, um, <laughs> and it looked really cool, but you couldn't get hardware for it. And there was this other company called Amiga Inc. that apparently was going to have Amiga OS 5, which would be awesome, but it wasn't available yet, so I kind of punted it. But at some point, 2009, I saw a Sam cheap on eBay, and I bought it. I fell in love with it, and I've been using Amigas ever since. I've got the Sam 440, Pegasus 2, the Amiga 1 X5000, uh, the Amiga 1 A1222. Um, if Aeon ever produces any other machines, I'll buy those. So, <laughs> very happy. So we, we talked a lot about our experience uh, individually with the, the system. So I wanted to switch it back over to something Daniel was talking about, about being in a place where there's only one other Amiga user like growing up. Because I think, again, as we talk about these different, effectively, different countries, uh, different communities, and, and, and how those communities in, in influenced your Amiga usage and, and whatnot. So, uh, Daniel, do you want to share maybe a funny story or something about when when it was just two of you in the jungle with your 500s? <laughs> <laughs> I got a funny story. But, but, um, I remember that, um, well, as I said, the uh, software supply was short. Every, every year, one of either him or me um, had uh, home vacations in Germany for some weeks. So when one of us returned, he brought some 20 discs or so with new games, which had to last for one year then. Um, so um, he was a big fan of such uh, soccer managers. And uh, there, there, there was some, some new uh, uh, soccer manager coming out, but we didn't have any access to it. So. Uh, but, uh, uh, what was possible was that I wrote such a soccer manager instead. So, um, but I guess it, it, it was never finished. But uh, anyway, that was our, our way of dealing with the with the uh, lack of software back then. I mean, yeah, <laughs> we made the best out of it. So going back to to Niels in Denmark, I think you had a, a different experience with. Uh, with with the Amiga community there. Yes, um, most of the uh, Amiga community back when I started uh, were very much into games, and uh, they also had uh, lots of uh, LAN parties where they met and uh, coded demos and uh, stuff like that. I I was a bit older than than most of the kids back then. I um, I got my first Amiga in '89, and I was uh, 37 years back, uh, 36 or something. So I uh, and I never uh, did much gaming or or uh, graphics or anything like that. Uh, it was more about applications and stuff like that. Uh, but but uh, I did go to some of the events there, and, and uh, there were uh, lots of people having lots of fun. Actually, in in the um, 90s, I think uh, uh, one of the biggest parties in Europe were, were the yearly party in, in Jutland. Uh, 
I forget what it's called, uh, uh, but there was, uh, it was uh, famed all over Europe for its uh, demo competitions and so on. Uh, a funny story is that uh, out of uh, those uh, demo groups that existed back then, uh, there was one that, that also was famous all over Europe. And uh, some years ago, uh, when we moved into the house we live in now, I found out that uh, their graphics uh, uh, guy was actually my uh, back door neighbor. <laughs> he has uh, since uh, started a, a, a company dealing with the 3D graphics for uh, dental uh, work. So <laughs> probably stemming from back then. But uh, if we fast forward to today's uh, Amiga uh, scene, uh, we're in the unfortunate situation that the, the only Danish uh, website Amiget.dk uh, had to close some months back. So uh, that uh, uh, remaining group of Amigans, which may be counted like uh, 40, 50 all over the country uh, who were active, at least judging by who visited the site back then, uh, it has become very much more difficult to contact each other. So. We are looking for a solution to, to try to uh, find a way to, to maybe uh, get a corner of, of the Swedish side or something like that. Uh, also, um, I, I managed to get in touch with, with the, uh, some of those users uh, via email before I get, got over here. And uh, the, it confirmed what I already uh, figured. Uh, the, re the, remain the remaining uh, Danish Amigans are almost all into classics and into gaming and having fun, but many of them also state that they are very interested in and uh, think it's really good that there's still uh, some work going on and new machines being made and uh, stuff like that. But uh, there are only a few of us left that actively use the NG systems. So, so we very much depend on not only being Danish Amigans, but uh, also getting around to, to uh, the countries around us, which I try to do a lot also. So Steve, as what is your relationship to Amal? Are you the president? I don't think I've asked. What do you do for Amal? Amal. Um, Amiga users of Calgary, yes, yes. Um, that's an interesting group. It, it was once 300 plus strong, I believe, but uh, Len knows the history better than I do, because I was uh, in Saskatchewan way before that. Um, I moved to Alberta a long time ago, 20 years ago, and um, it uh, I, I came to the club meetings for a while and then people started dropping off and um, said, uh, who wants to be president or chair? <laughs> I don't know, I'll try it. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> I got suckered in. And then they all left. <laughs> but there, there's new people coming and going from, now, from, from time to time. Uh, we recently had... Um, a, a, a show in in Calgary actually and uh, there were I know Kevin counted at least 50 in the room at one time and it was a very small space because we thought 20 were coming 25 50 show up and maybe he's guessing but there could have been 100 150 that came and went wow. and a lot of young faces and Trevor was also there, because you know, Trevor goes everywhere. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I was so so cramped, I couldn't count anything. I don't know what you did. You bother counting? It's packed. It's packed. It's packed. So there seems to be a lot of Amiga people in Calgary, but only about eight show up to our meetings so far because <laughs> we're we're bad at advertising and such. Anyway, that's so that's what's uh, going on there. Interesting. And then uh, LD. 
Do yeah. you, you're in New York? Well, actually I'm in Connecticut, but it's close, it's, it's near as enough to make some difference. Are, are you involved in any of the local Amigans? Do you know anybody around? I do know some of the local Amigans, actually, and, and believe it or not, there's actually quite a few, particularly in the city, Brooklyn, Long Island. The one place, there, there is an active user group in Westchester County, which is to the north-ish of the city. Um, and of course, some of its members include Bill Winters and the Guru Meditation uh, Duo. The problem is they meet at the mall in White Plains. For the love of God, anybody who's trying to go, and do, if, if, Bill, if you're out there, I would love to come to the meetings, but try to get on to 287 it, it, in the middle of the evening. You forget about it from my direction. It's, it's the, the traffic is biblical. Um, but I, I understand, but I do understand that they get uh, uh, you know, regular monthly meetings. And there's also quite a few people in upstate New York. There's a couple guys in Buffalo. Um, well, Tim Peters actually was, or did live in New York. Yeah, I think still does, actually. Think so. um, of course, our great American dealer, Amiga on the Lake. Hi, Aaron. Um, they're up in Oswego, which is uh, up in um, far north New York. I know a couple of Amigans in Vermont. I know of several in Boston. So they're scattered about. and. Um, it's a shame that we don't have more user groups generally than we used to. Uh, I'm up is great, SAC is great, but if you think back to um, you know the 80s and the 90s, the user groups were absolutely massive, and it wasn't just for the Amiga; it was for the Mac, PC, you name it. People used to actually physically get together, and um, that's really fun. It's one of the great things about AmiWest. But these days, I suppose, with the forums and Facebook have kind of replaced that mechanism, and it's, it's absolutely incredible to see the number of people on the Amiga Facebook group, for example. There's tons of them in the Northeast. So, and there's quite a few on Amiga.org, quite a few on Amiga World. We just need to get them out here. And, and Tony, in your experience in Australia? Well, as I said, guys, I started out in the television industry. And it really spread from there because of my friend who went and bought this shop and started selling Amiga. So, I very soon met all the other customers of his Amigas at the shop and we got together at somebody's place uh, once a month or something and of those people back in 1987, 88, there are still two of them who are regular attenders of the Sydney Amiga Users Group every month and the um, SORG as it's called. Um, usually it gets about 10, 12 people on the lot every month. Granted, they usually spend their time playing with classics, not so much the NG machines, but they have a um, strong presence on Facebook these days. And there's a similar sized group in Brisbane, Queensland and in Victoria, down south, so it hasn't died out by any means. And although the NG's uh, side of it is not as strong as the classic side, I'd say looking back at the way the classic side was in the 1980s, it's no smaller now. No smaller than the 80s. Mm. Mm. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm. So, Elvi, you started with the uh, <coughs> next generation system. I think everyone here on the panel owns one, right? So, the, the audience at Gaming West, how many people here own an NG Amiga? It's a good number. Trevor needs to give us, the, Matthew needs to get us the tape work. i Trevor <coughs> so that everyone can put their hand up. Um, you came into the Amiga scene in 2009. Um, when, when and, and I've been doing this for, since uh, 89 as well. When you, when you got the NG system, how much, have you seen anything that made you think about going back to plat or, or getting involved in the classic side? Because as we're hearing around the world, 
you know, classic is still the, the main platform, but as someone who's come at this from the NG side, do you, did you buy a 500? Do you want to get a 1200? I'm just kind of curious. No. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, I, I, let, me, let me back up because I'm going to get tarred and feathered here in a few minutes. Uh, the 68K machines are awesome, but the truth is, is that all the software that I really want to run, the productivity software, it runs really, really well, either natively or under emulation on PowerPC, on the next generation machines. And as lovely and as gorgeous and as wonderful as those machines are, and they are terrific, it just runs slower. And it's not as stable. Um, the Vampire looked really, really interesting. I mean, I thought that might be the, the, the kicker for me to go and get a 68K machine um, and get a Vampire in it, and it would be speedy enough. But while it's a, a tremendous improvement over the you know, uh, 020s, 030s, and 040s, and 060s that people have been using in their classic boxes, even compared to an older SAM, it's still quite a bit slower. And I like to use my Amiga also for uh, watching videos. My kids. Um, they also use it for that purpose. Every single thing that David Attenborough has ever filmed over the past 50 years is digitized on my X5000. And between that and a lot of the games, including, by the way, uh, Queen's Battlefield and Battlefield, among others, I can't get my son off the thing. So um, I can't really imagine us going back to a 68K machine because in our particular case, it, wouldn't, it would provide us, unfortunately, less utility. That having been said, they are absolutely magnificent to look at, and this is a piece of history. I, I at some point, I'm, I'm probably gonna probably gonna go ahead and get one. But the truth is, is uh, I really love NG. I really love OS4. I love the way it looks, and um, so I, yeah, I, I hate to say it, but I think <laughs> my classic experience, if ever I want it for other purposes, is going to be provided by uh, Amiga Forever, at least for now. Cool. So, so Daniel, you mentioned that you uh, have been coding for Windows for a long time and other systems, then got back into Amiga 10. Now you're getting back to, to 68,000. What, what has that journey been like in terms of coming full circle? I mean, um, I didn't really plan anything of that. It just uh, happened. So, um, in, uh, I, I finished my, my, my Amiga career in the late 90s because I simply had to, had to use a PC back then. And it uh, uh, just happened that I didn't use the Amiga uh, lesser and lesser and lesser with, uh, every week. So it uh, just got forgotten. And um, the return in 2010, um, well, several things happened back then. By, by coincidence, I um, uh, got in touch with the guy from Socom, uh, those guys who made the Battles classic you know, shooters, hybrids, and battle squadron. At that time, they uh, planned or they made an iOS port or remake of their, their old battle squadron game. And by pure coincidence, it was the same time when I returned. And it also was the time when I um, was actually active uh, in uh, game programming, pretty, pretty um, serious game programming for iOS and Android. And so we got in touch in some Amiga forum, Amiga world, I guess. and. Um, just by coincidence, and we, we talked, and I gave them some hints about uh, how they could do several uh, uh, things to uh, get best performance on those, uh, those iOS systems. I was one in the uh, second generation of the And, um, well, all of a sudden, uh, I was hired for doing the Android board, and then I started to, to uh, Built up my my framework for all the upcoming uh, Amiga OS 4 and Morpheus gaming titles. Uh, I for example, so there were several things coming together. I met the right people, and well, there was Battle Squadron remastered for Amiga OS 4, and so on and so on. And so, well, it's, a, it's quite a weird journey. So. After that, um, I, um, yeah, right, um, 
during my development, I encountered uh, or faced several um, issues with Warp 3D back then with the R200 uh, uh, driver. And that's when I got in touch with Hyperion. Uh, I asked them to fix those bugs and uh, well, they asked me to fix them myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I, so I um, uh, entered the, the uh, O4 development team to fix those bugs which prevented my games to work. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, that's uh, when I started with the graphics uh, driver stuff, which in turn ended in uh, uh, being hired by uh, Aeon for the OpenGL ES driver. So, yeah, it's, uh, so the moral of the story <laughs> is parents don't let your kids go to the Amiga forums. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, exactly. Yeah. So, Steve, you presented on Exec SG, so you probably have a, uh, an NG system somewhere in your house. <laughs> uh, do I have an NG system? <laughs> I have a lot of NG systems. <laughs> do you have any classics left? Uh, sort of. Uh, Alok has a Amiga 3000, and it's in my garage. <laughs> <laughs> in a box somewhere. <laughs> so no, I don't use them anymore. I, I did fire it up uh, one one day to make sure it still worked, and uh, I uh, I wasn't impressed anymore. <laughs> kind of like LD, it's like, uh, I used to like this. Yeah, <laughs> so I've kind of moved on. Although uh, again, like LD, you try Amiga forever on um, PC. That's fine. That's fine. I don't have to wait for the floppy. You know, good stuff like that. I, I was never into the Frankenstein stuff, Frankenstein monster stuff. Um, Vampire sounds interesting. Never tried one. It's an interesting concept. I'd like to try that again. But uh, I don't much like the classic stuff anymore. I love the software, but uh, the the hardware is, is kind of me for me personally. <laughs> you probably don't have a classic car. Classic car? No, no, no. Car, cars are transportation. Oh man, come on. That's it. Those are fighting words for later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I hang around with car guys. I hear them talking about it. And like, eh. <laughs> There's got to be something there between those of us that like classic cars and keep our Vegas running. <laughs> Tony, do you still have uh, any classics running? I have an Amiga 500, which um, I bought for the kids many years ago, so that they'd leave my 1000 alone. <laughs> it didn't work. They ended up fighting over who was going to have the 1000 and who was going to have the 500. But um, when I got my first NG machine, and my first XE, and that was in the days when the little chip the kickstart chip had been sent out, they were all right protected and, and we, we weren't able to update the, not kickstart, the UBU rather, we weren't able to update the UBU. So I had a uh, something data uh, adjunct on the side of the A500 anyway with a disk drive in it. Mm -hmm. So I thought, right, I'll go to this machine to use. So I built a um, the EEPROM programmer into, into the disk drive and with two sockets, one that I could copy from and write to and so on. And um, for the 10, 11, 12 years that I had the XE as my main machine, this, the, the 500 was the backup for the, for the XE. <laughs> But uh, when finally I gave the XE away a few years ago, uh, I'm afraid the 500 hasn't been used much since then. The main problem with my 500 nowadays is I don't have anything to display the picture. We don't have analog TV in Australia anymore. Uh, I don't have an analog monitor which still works and can display 15 kilohertz. Uh, so it's not the sort of thing that I can just say, oh, I'll play a game of Marble madness, or something. <laughs> just can't do it anymore. Well, there are solutions for that. 
I think some of the vendors are still in here. Yes, <laughs> thanks. Uh, I do have quite a few NG machines, as, as most of you know. I, I don't have the XC anymore, but I still have a SAM 440 um, EP, the original one, 440 Flex, 460, the one that X1000, the two X5000s now, the 20 under 40, and a table. And uh, they're all hooked up in pairs, and they all form um, debug platforms so that any time I write some error bit of software, I can check it on every platform before I let people like Nils <laughs> lose some of it. Do you get like some sort of special customer call or reward from Trevor? Does he give you a hug like for the CC? He gives me a hug, but I'm not sure whether that's because. No, it's right, we won't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and then the question, the, the last question for, for Neil. About NT machines or plastic machines, yeah. I um, use uh, the only plastic machine that hasn't uh, the capability of running US4 is an old uh, H1200 with a uh, 1260 uh, accelerator and it uh, has the very important task of being a terminal for debugging my um, my XE or rather it had when, when my XE was still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Since then I have uh, very rarely used that. Uh, I do have a lot of uh, machines well, I have another A1200 with PVC, which I do use for uh, beta testing and uh, like to turn on now and then for, but, uh, but it's very noisy because it's in a, a big old cabinet with a lot of uh, uh, fans in it, so uh, I mostly turn it on when I have to uh, test something or update it or something. But apart from that, I have uh, also SAM 440 EP, SAM 460, um, and an XCG4, which sadly doesn't uh, run at the moment, XCG3, and uh, X1000, and an X5000 as well. So, uh, and uh, just for, for this trip, I have also set up a, a virtual Amiga on the Amiga Forever on, on my. Uh, New laptop, and it has worked perfectly. It uh, runs OS4 uh, latest beta that in uh, 1925 and 1080. So uh, it's fine. Uh, yeah, that's about it, I guess. Okay, so we have time for for one last question. So one of the the common themes, of course, is gaming. So I'm going to ask everyone. Oh, what was it called? Uh, one of those games with, uh, where you have to shoot bubbles and there's a fairy on the top. Marble? No. Uh, bubble bubble? Not bubble bubble, bubble but ghost. bubble something. Bubble? Bubble ghost? No. <laughs> anyway, yeah, there, was, there was a game there. Uh, it uh, needed uh, good power, so uh, on my 1260 it ran pretty well. <coughs> And uh, we enjoyed that. But uh, apart from that, uh, well, sometimes I uh, play a bit of open transport tycoon, uh, stuff like that. Mm. And uh, yeah, I did enjoy the um, uh, the Santa uh, shooter game that came out uh, a, a couple of years ago uh, for a few months. <laughs> a few months is yeah. a long time. That's. Tony? I've never been a great games player. Not because I don't play, don't enjoy playing games, but because I'm just no damn good at it. <laughs> um, in the days when we had several Commodore 64s in the house, and there'd be one child playing on each Commodore 64. But how many kids? How many Commodore 64s did you have? Well, how many kids did you have? That's easier. <laughs> Three kids, okay. at least four Commodore 64s. Um, so you had room for one more kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> room for one more kid. But I do recall, though, that 
the overall favourite was Impossible Mission. Mm. I, I, I don't, I, I don't remember ever seeing a game that came up to the the standard of intelligence that was built into that one. Dave? Yeah. So uh, lately, I've been enjoying all of the Innsbruck Player X ones. Uh, is that how you pronounce it? For me, really close. I have no idea what you said. <laughs> the uh, Antwickler. Yeah. Antwickler. Ah. Oh, you're playing, oh, you're you're playing the, uh, the new uh, small voices. Small voices. Small voices. Small voices. Mace. Spencer. Frogs. My father loves frogs. Oh, frogs is a bit simple. You like that one, do you? My father loves that Oh, you did. <laughs> anyway, those have been, I don't have a, a favorite favorite, but those ones have been very, very interesting to me. Cause Spencer, I think is true. Yes, Spencer, Spencer. It's a little, it's, it's, it's very easy or very hard. It's both. It's, it's not in between. It's just <laughs> a little platformer. Yeah, so that, that's what I've been enjoying lately. Um, yeah, I've been playing games since I was in high school. So. I used to crack games and sell them, actually. But don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No <laughs> wonder you haven't had time to fix Eldie's lottery. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on, man? Watch Santa Baby Wrist. Stay Santa Baby Wrist. And the stream. That's in the mic. I'm almost afraid to ask you, Daniel. You probably don't have enough time to play games. Because you're too busy writing them. But. Yeah, that's right. Um, but thanks for the question anyway, because um, uh, it allows me to close the circle. Because, as you mentioned, I returned to 68K recently. So, of course, to make a game. A soccer manager, right? No, no, no. <laughs> but um, as, I, as I said, I met the guys from Copcom back then. And uh, now I'm doing a shooter game with uh, the origin, original graphics guy from Better Spawn, Tobin Larson. Is that announced yet? Hmm? Is this announced? Yeah, yeah, announced? Yes, yes, yes. I showed a prototype at the Amiga 34. Uh, what's it called? Do you have an idea? Yes, Hyperborea. Hyperborea. Mm. Well, a, why don't we get a prototype? It's, mm. it's, it's probably the technically most advanced Amiga 1200 shooting game. This thing is a lot of fun. Unaccelerated. So I guess this will be my favorite game. The next one, my favorite Amiga game is actually Swift. Okay. The third round in vertical. It's technically so amazingly well done. So many objects on a standard A500. Uh, it's, yeah, it's fantastic and it's brilliant gameplay. Last time on the Gamescom, um, me and another guy from the Media Future team played it all. Good to know. And Aldi, do you get any time on your uh, NG system playing a game? I sure try to. Uh, the problem is, you're asking for a favorite game, and there's a lot of games that I like to play. So I'm not really sure how to do this because I don't know that I have. You gotta have a. If, if, you gotta have a favorite. Probably the game that I play the most, um, particularly late at night, is I, is the one that I can't pronounce, which is Penison. You <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so I know which one. Yeah, My Brick, right? which is unbelievably good because it's incredibly simple and incredibly complicated. As it goes on, it's like it's about like fifty thousand different gaming um, uh, paradigms all thrown into one, and it's absolutely fantastic. Plus, it has lots of very bright colors, so I can play it late at night and when my wife is trying to sleep. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so probably that. One. But uh, Bo Mace, um, uh, all, you know, all those great Zelda games that, uh, that, 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 that all the new ones. Those, those are really terrific. Um, I still play Quake and Doom, uh, believe it or not, and uh, a lot of stuff under Warp SNES, uh, for Super Nintendo under emulation, and we play a lot of games in the house, West Knob, a lot. Good. So, fun. It's funny you bring up uh, 
how you're saying Hansen or Hitler. Yeah, I can't pronounce it. Huanison. Huanison. Huanison? Yeah, I would second yeah. that. The, uh, the, the author also did uh, BOH. Yes, and that's, yeah. that's a very good game, and I've got the box edition of that and Go mm -hmm. Advanced. Oh, I've also got the box edition of course, <laughs> whatever that is, Tennessee. <laughs> And recently they made another one. Uh, yeah, Blast the Shooter. Yeah, yeah no, Blast no. Oh, well, no, no, Speed. Yeah, Speed Grid. Speed Grid. Yeah. Oh, but, I haven't but, tried that one. But if, just, yeah. if you don't follow it, all of the games are an extension of the same story. They're, I mean, because they're, they're radically different games. Some are available on like different platforms, but it's all the same story. Oh, see, I ignore the story. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, well, we're, uh, we're out of time for the, the panel discussion. Thank you for being available. It's informative what's going on in the world. Um, we have a speaker next, right? A surprise speaker? Yes. Brian's coming. Okay. Um, should we, we, we should vacate so that you can speak. You have to stay in the box. <laughs> I'm sitting in the box. <laughs> Don't block the box. <laughs> <laughs>